Hi, welcome to the Secret Men's Business Podcast. And this is Joey Buzzertal, and we're up to season two. How exciting as we get closer to the end of the year where we will start season three. Now, on today's show, we're going to be speaking to someone who's going to talk about something I'm really hearing a lot about. And I actually personally found a way to connect with this myself this year. And that is, what is your legacy and how do you actually create your legacy for you? On today's show, we're going to be speaking to Luke Fenwick from Sydney. He's a coach and he's going to talk about legacy, but more importantly, talk about how he was able to change one thing in his life, his career, and become a powerful and influential coach to many, many people. Luke, how are you? I'm good. I'm good, Joe. Good to good to be here. Uh, I am, though, in sunny Melbourne. <gasps> oh, sorry. Sorry, he's in sunny oh, Melbourne, that's, everyone. <laughs> that's, that's okay. That this reminds is, this me. Is, I put this background for you to show you that it was yeah. raining this morning. It was windy. <laughs> I don't know. I, I never really watched The Simpsons a lot, but there's this episode where I don't know which the band was, and they had he's got the guitar, and then he's like, hello, whichever suburb, and he looked on the back of the guitar, and it was the wrong name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of, got to change but now i'm down in melbourne it's been blowing an absolute i know i'm so sorry that i forgot i thought that you i thought you were in sydney because i thought all the good looking successful coaches are in sydney (laughs) so i've got got to get out more don't i (laughs) yeah yeah but hey if this if that's as um if that's as bad as things get for us today then then we're in a good spot so 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 people can get to know you a little bit before we start on this particular topic do you want to give an overview of just about um, don't go into too much detail because you're gonna. I want to, to expand that in the um, in the questions, but just tell a little bit about what you do now, I guess, and about your life. Yeah, I, I'll keep it kind of succinct. So uh, the most important thing that happens in my life is uh, I'm a dad. I've got two kids. I've got a little boy. Uh, he is three and a bit, and I've got a little girl who's turning seven months in about 12 days time. So uh, married, that's the kind of personal stuff on the side, like that's the most important things. But uh, professionally, I'm a life impact coach. So I I say I'm a behavior strategist. I work with people around their behaviors and habits and how they lead their life. That's that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, You know, like everybody else, you know, I like keeping fit and, you know, getting back into running, mm. which is really, really and, nice. And how did you, let's just start with, because you're a Melbourne guy, how did you deal with lockdown? How did you find yeah. that 200 plus days? Oh, look, we um, we were pretty fortunate in regards to maybe we didn't have some of the, the pressures that some families faced. You know, we were, we were pretty good. We had, you know, daycare for our little boy for most of the time other than the last 10 weeks. So we were sheltered from that. Um, you know, we didn't have to do homeschooling for teenagers and whatnot. So we really kind of got into our little bubble, you know, you mm. could say that uh, as a family. And, you know, I continued to, you know, focus on what I'm doing, you know, support my wife and, you know, with what I could around the house. And we just did our things as a family and did lots of walks and walked around the park when we could. Then, you know, the parks got closed, but we did what a lot of people mm. It, and that was tried to make the best of what we could and, and spend time and, and not get too caught up in some of these other things yeah. that, we, that we couldn't control. Mm. So. Yeah, I sort of like to share with the audience that we have a fundamental belief on this podcast and that is there is a, either that you would go into the story or you adapt. And so I, just, I guess that it's a, it was an important question to ask you because I really want people to understand that we have possibility every day to adapt. And we don't have to listen to the story of, you know, if I have to hear the, another person say, oh, the COVID lockdown. But in reality, we're in lockdown, we're in lockdown. And so we can either tell the story or we can find a way to make it fun or enjoyable, like you you mentioned. Well, yeah, you, you know, you can fight against whatever it is that, that you're sitting in. And often I talk to people about and say, well, what is the what's the lesson that's being you know served up to you what is the truth within this story and fighting against some of these things really doesn't do you any good and it serves no purpose it might work you up and it might make you agitated and then that might lead to some other things but at the end of the day it it doesn't help so for us you know we we were frustrated like anybody else at times but it's just not letting that you know, take over with all these other emotions we found. So we yeah. did the best we could. We, we weren't we weren't perfect by any stretch, but we did as much as best we could. So. Yeah. 
So we're talking about um, legacy through being happy, I guess, through what you do. So um, I know you mentioned in your in your um, bio that the, you know you had a corporate job, and I guess we'll talk about that a little bit. But when you know when I looked at that, what you did, and I saw it on paper, it looked like the dream job. But you were saying that you were finding yourself being unhappy and it was becoming soulless so what's your interpretation of how something that looks so perfect and ideal the money the the success the prestige of some jobs or some even choices of life can become the opposite what do you think are some of the factors that can create that soulless energy well i think sometimes it's it's how we change in ourselves is right so if you're in your dream job or perceived dream job or something that you thought was fantastic or going to be brilliant and and all these other you know ways to express well like what has changed in you you know i had three amazing jobs in different ways right so if i go back a few steps i worked for lvmh for a while so i was at louis vuitton mold hennessy and worked for the liquor so mold and chandon dom perignon verve clico belvedere all these amazing brands and traveled the world and you know went to restaurants all this kind of stuff which was which was great very lavish lifestyle but i enjoyed it you know really afforded some amazing things left there and went to Melbourne United, the basketball club. And that was a passion of mine. Like I love the sport of basketball. It was about bringing the sport back to relevance because it had been in the wilderness for a while. I met um, a guy called Larry Kesselman who just purchased the NBL in 2016. So I was there um, and loving, loving that. But I left there to go and work in this bigger corporate job, which you're talking about in advertising marketing agency. And that was for, you know, a good amount of money, you know, nothing, you know, we're not talking millions of dollars here, but a very, very good wage, which I thought was going to enable all these other fantastic things to happen in life, you know, some property development and buy this, that, the other, but it really didn't deliver any of those things. If anything, it delivered me um, aligned with what was important, which was my, my wife and my boy at that point in time, not living what really mattered to myself um very anxious very agitated you know waking up every morning at 4 a.m and and a real mess so i'd gone from thinking that this was an environment that i really wanted to be in on the outside and then when i got on the inside there was all these things that just really weren't what i wanted anymore as well as the challenges that were faced in it and it was you know, time to make a change. So, so was it like, was it just like, did it just drain you? Well, like, what was the sensation? That you, I mean, I know everyone will be individual, but did you just feel like I, it's funny how a lot of people want more, but they don't realize that that comes sometimes with a cost, like time, it comes with, you know, energy. So, for you, was it, did you just, it was a sense of knowing, or was it like an accumulated buildup of just feeling like you were losing who you were? Yeah, look, I went in there thinking, one, this was a job that was going to be one for me for the next decade, right? Like there was this really big ambition on the back of it. I then started to realise that there was some cultural misalignment with people in the organisation not wanting me to be there. Me then maybe not approaching the role like I had in all these other areas. So I'd always approach roles in regards to, yes, hard work, but I was curious in regards to how do I learn more, be more, find success, et cetera, et cetera. And I just wasn't wasn't getting that in this environment. So there was all of these challenges from that side of things, which then led to me being, you know, anxious, stressed, you know, borderline, kind of depressed, mm. as I said, you know, waking up every morning for about four or five months at 4 a.m., just churning, which then led to me being not a great dad or husband and not in a sinister way, but just not in a great way so when all of a sudden that started to happen and i was and talked to my wife a lot because she could see all this happening with me and all these other emotions were coming out it's like what matters here does the job matter you know does the salary matter do i push through like i had in all these other circumstances and find a way but maybe find a way and then lose these other things in, mm. in life that mattered more. And that for me was, no, I'm not going to risk that to achieve this. 
Mm. And that, that was a really big realization that that job was not going to be a long-term strategy if it came at the cost of my family. How, um, because of, because you're pretty, um, you know, you're pretty connected and you're pretty, you know, you had, I guess, education and things like that. So say if someone was in a similar situation to what you described and they didn't have the wife that was open and they didn't have maybe some of the awareness, can you give them, uh, firstly, can you tell us how long it took you and maybe um, some of the smaller steps in regards to making that decision? Because I believe there's a lot of men that, I think that you're really brave and I love that. Bravery is a good thing for men, but I think a lot of men are also consumed by the their role and they may not take the risk like you did. Mm. So, yeah, so firstly, how long did it take you think for you to step from one place to another? Well, I was, I was only there for nine months, right? And so to, it's not, it to, wasn't that long then. Yeah, and to put this into perspective, you know, my first roles, you know, my formative years, you know, start out of high school, I was in retail for about 14 years. I worked for Meyer and Jeans West, total 14 years. Was at uh, LVMH, Mowat Hennessy for about seven years. Okay, and I was okay. at Melbourne United for another four years. Right. So I was always in these roles for a long period of time. So I went into this place and, and it started to unfold quickly. Reason, reasonably quickly because I was, a, you know, I suppose I'd always looked back and, had I taken notice of some of the things that I was doing right or wrong, maybe not, but all of a sudden I was being really you know, shook to my core about mm. where is all this coming from. So I really had to take stock. And I think to answer your question is that, you know, your body is there to give you this understanding of what's happening in your environment, right? You know, when you're feeling that angst and agitation and this conflict in you, and we all know what that is. I don't care whether or not you spend zero time reflecting or a lot of it. We all know when there is this misalignment in it because we get that feeling in our gut. Mm. And my message to anybody that might be sitting out there listening is if you're sitting here going, I have this agitation, I have this angst, I'm a little bit more shorter than I was or I'm a little bit more aggravated than I was, like you need to take the time just to, to kind of sit with yourself and I always say to clients, like, well, what am I thinking and what am I feeling and what is the purpose of that? And, and just come at it from that angle with this mm. curiosity. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What is the purpose of that? And, and then go from there. Yeah. So when I mentioned um, the pigeonholing, why do you feel men, or are they, I mean, they could be, they are, I know they're changing, but why do you think men feel stuck in this whole thing to actually seek out careers that don't necessarily make them happy. Like, you know, what needs to change? Because, I mean, I know lots of clients that are minors, for example. And the reason why they're minors, maybe, you know, um, now it's not as busy as it used to be. It's money, right? And now all of a sudden, you know, they realize it's hard work and they realize it's it fly in, fly out. They realize they're not seeing their families as much. Yeah. And so there's this, and then they've also then overcommitted, because they've got more money, they bought a bigger house. And so yes. what yep. do you think is wrong? How do, what are they doing wrong? What are men doing wrong in regards to their choices? Well, you know, it, it's a really good question because it's it's easy sometimes to fall in the trap and say that, that that is wrong, right? You know, the situation this particular person in is, is wrong. And I think sometimes you've got to step back. Often at a younger age, we're about, you know, if you look at that whole Maslow theory, thing, mm. right, you know, how that kind of works through people are about trying to understand, well, where do I find this security and how do I find security? Usually that's that's within wealth, right? If I earn more, then I can provide more or I can buy more or I can be more secure. I can have some safety. So people get into that from a really early age. And over time, as you, as you know, and your listeners know, is that we start to then form these biases. So the biases that we think are creating success in our life, which often that's not the case, but it's the story that we tell ourselves. So we do these things over time and we just keep on heading down this path until, you know, 10 or 15 years down the track, something happens to us and we start to wake up. But it's really common. We are caught up in, in what we think matters most or this perceived notion it could be a cultural thing it could be a society thing it could be a family thing any of those reasons that are what push us usually at an early age towards things mm. you know, just think our, our, we are still very much forming who we are 
from how our brain is wired until our mid 20s you know our values and beliefs are usually directed from the culture that sits around us and our families so all of these things are happening to us and, and we're just it's like jumping jumping in a river yeah. right and then we're just yeah. flowing down this river and all of a sudden we get slapped in the face and start to realize yeah. what happened i mean i'm yeah. laughing because um <laughs> i never forget that when i got into university i was so proud and excited and my dad said why why are you become why are you doing that you should become a tradie and it was like this whole twisted um realization that my dad saw the world so different to me like you know and, and the academic he still doesn't doesn't feel like i work right because i've been here talking to you and he'll because i live with him and he'll say you know who, what are you doing who are you talking to is that you are you working and it's it's this bizarre thing how there's a misalignment there um yeah, what what did, his mind is very different isn't it right it's about working yeah. hard and getting dirty and all that well, um yeah for him that's, yeah that's 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 right his his vision of when you say work is is what you've said your vision of what what work is or you know i talk to people about their aspiration for life is very very different again and if you're not clear on what your aspiration your personal version is then that's where things can can get off mm. track um we t you know you were telling us about that that time at that last job how it was becoming really sort of difficult you're feeling anxious so what do you feel are some of the main factors of corporate burnout in in 2021 like what are some of the and this is a guys podcast but i guess to anyone what what are some of the things that you may be noticing with your clients now that the employees are feeling and the employers are going you know there's a lot of shift covid's one of them but what do you think are the main things yeah, look, you know, I wrote a blog when COVID first hit and I thought one of the really interesting things was going to be how, how do people manage that dynamic of not being in an office environment where they have the opportunity just to kind of engage and socialise with people, that dynamic space of, hey, I've got this great idea, let's work it, work it through together, um, let's go get a coffee, all of these kinds of things that enabled people just to, you know, what do humans want? We want to contribute, we want to be heard, we want to be part of a community. And a lot of those things have really been taken away from people now. So I think that's causing a real challenge. This other part that's happening too is that people are getting up that aren't back in the offices they're getting up, they're going into their home office, they're doing their work in their home office, and then they're kind of just going in and out of the kitchen and back. So that's yeah. creating this other burnout as well. But where are people falling down is when they don't set these, this is my boundary and this is my non-negotiable for work. And what I mean by that is my boundary, I won't go past this. Yeah. And my non-negotiable is I must do this every day. So if people aren't clear on those two things, then that's when that's when they often get pulled into, you know, their office environment is dictating that these things mm. must happen to them. And, are, and you that's talk, are you talking are you talking about like things like time or meeting KPIs and you know like because one of the big things I'm noticing with my clients is that they were in lockdown, which means everyone's in lockdown, but yet the salespeople had to still meet their KPIs when they weren't going to sales meetings, and the business didn't understand when they said, hold on a second, we, it's harder to actually do a meeting or a sale on the phone. And so they said, I, and I understand that they're getting pressure from above and everyone's getting the pressure. Um, is that what you meant? Like those sort of pressures and things that are being well, pulled and pushed or? That's, um, it's a really interesting thing. I think if you're working in an organization that doesn't understand the sales process um, and, you know, how not meeting people face to face is the challenge, then, then that's maybe a podcast for another day. But, but, <laughs> but, but for me, it is, these are the things that I can control, right? We often, when we're in an environment, and I certainly saw it within the workspaces, that we get so caught up within this is what the organization is demanding that I do. Mm. This is what my manager is demanding that I do. This is what my team is demanding of me as a leader. So if, if you have all these demands coming at you, but you're not clear on your boundaries i won't do this and i won't do that i and my non-negotiables so what i talk about that so my non-negotiable could be if i was in a in a corporate place i need to knock off at six o'clock every night because i want to be home to bath the kids feed the kids whatever it might be like that is a non-negotiable a boundary might be that hey you know I, I won't do these many hours or i won't sacrifice this like these are really important to have in your mind so you're you are 
again, controlling what you can control, mm. being very clear that when they are challenged, why do they matter to you? Mm. I mean, then, yeah, because I'm, I, I, listen, I love it, but at the same time, how do you, I just want to make sure the listeners understand, I guess, what to do when you get pushed back from the business. So are you saying if those boundaries are being um, abused and people, you know, because I just had a client this morning who was taught, like did that, right? But then when she started the job, it was totally different. Like they did not honor any of those boundaries. So yeah. she left, she left. So, so, you, right. and, so you and have, found so another you have, job. Yeah. So you have the choice, right? Yeah, so, okay. and this is, and you know, you might sit down and go, well, it's easy for this guy to say, but we are surrounded by choices all of the time. We can either do this or, or not do that. We have this choice to take this action or not do that. And the same thing goes in the workplace. If you're really clear that, you know, this is what the business wants from me, mm. but I am not willing to do that, then your choice is, do I stay or do I go? Yeah. Do I have that conversation with my manager or boss in regards to this doesn't align with what's really important to me within life? And often we are in a situation, certainly early on in, in careers, where the career is the most important thing. And I'll do anything to get that next promotion. I'll get, do anything to get that next pay rise. If that's, if that's how you want things to be, if that's how you want your life to be, awesome. It's not your place to say. It's not my place yeah. to say. They'll feel but, it anyway, wouldn't they? Like you were saying, they'll feel their body. 100%. That, that's where I say be clear on what your aspiration for life is. Be clear mm. on what your values are. And when you are clear on those things and then something creates that misalignment, then you can say to yourself, well, is this, is this the battle I'm willing to have right now? Am I willing to, you know, use that expression, die on this hill over this? You, you need to take the time to understand these things. And going back to some of your you know, early questions, early on, younger age, you're not really concerned about that stuff. And at that time, the right reasons. But over time... You start to explore these things more. You have more of these conversations to understand, like, who am I? What matters most? What am I willing to sacrifice? What am I willing to not sacrifice? Mm. Um, I just want to, I guess, ask you this question randomly. I don't want to go too deep into it, but it's more a statement. But how do you feel about um, knowing that the number one job for people between 16 and 25 is to be famous? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was listening to... Um, I was listening to a podcast, I can't remember who it was, and they were saying that I think 20 years ago that um, young kids around the age you're talking about, it was about community, it was about, you know, people around them. Flash forward to now, and the n number one, number two thing is to be rich and famous. I know. Back at that time, it was like 16 or 18, and it's really, really changed. And And how often do we... Do we make a decision around this immediate satisfaction, mm. right? And like, I want to be famous, right? Well, that's about this immediate satisfaction. I can see how many likes I'm getting. I can see that, you know, people are giving me the love heart and stuff like that. It's, but that's it, is, it is also appealing that. because back in my time, we, it was very hard. You had to, to get famous. discovered. Now, but you, you know, now someone has to post, has to post something and they've, 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 they've got a million followers. It's like, so they cool. see the ease of that. But I don't think that people sometimes realize that like doing this, a podcast, people say to me all the time, oh, wow, you're so natural, it's so easy. But they don't realize it's not, it's hard, it's work still, right? Yeah. And so people see people online and they it looks easy when they're posing and taking photos. But there's a lot that has to go on behind the scenes, which I guess if you want to be famous, you've got to be dedicated. Yeah, look, for everybody that might have a million followers, there's probably going to be a thousand people who've got a hundred followers. So, yeah. You know, well, I think the stats is if you have a million followers, there's something like 27 million people with a million followers. There you go. <laughs> but, but, you know, again, <coughs> what's the purpose to some of this stuff is to understand, well, what is what is what you want life to be about? Mm. And if if you want life to be about being famous, then, then yeah, hey, that, that's your call. But Take True. the time and effort to understand well, why do you really want that fame to exist? Mm. Um, do you think that the new, this is just something that I just heard about this morning, so I'm sorry it's not in your questions, but do you think that the new resignation culture is going to take off? As in people just quitting Well, apparently and... this, the, the, I was reading somewhere that this is going to be a new, for the next six months it's going to be a wave of hundreds and hundreds of people leaving their jobs. And there's going to be people seeking to do things like, I guess, what we do. 
And so it's they've called they've called it the resignation culture wave. And um, so, do you think it's something that will that will take off, or do you think it'll balance out? And it's just a maybe a COVID backlash. Oh, look! I, I look. It's a great question, and my <laughs> mind goes into all kinds of different ways. I think what does COVID provide a lot of people? It's the opportunity to reflect on: Is this really what I want my life to be about? Mm. You know, I'm getting up, I'm sitting on my Zoom, 700 Zoom meetings for the day. Is this really what it is? So. Do I think that there will be a lot of people that leave their jobs? Absolutely. I think there'll be that that opportunity. I think there's a reflection on people to say, well, how do I make my job remote? You know, I no longer want to be into this work environment. And a lot of it comes from this soul searching. So, you know, corporate spaces are going to change. People's careers are going to change. But, you know, what has this told us over mm. this last couple of years, even before COVID hit, that the world is changing and yeah. we need to continue to adapt and evolve. So, mm. And there was a point that you made about the, the pushing the boundary thing. They, rec they think that the, this wave of change is actually going to create a power for the person working. You know, like you said, I think that your point actually goes really well with that, is that like now people are going to say, no, I'm not working till midnight, I'm working till six. And That's if you don't like me, guess what? There's a thousand other jobs out there. And so... It is giving people more of a, a responsible uh, connection to their self-care. Yeah, 100%. I think what you're starting to read in the headlines is that there's this choice, right? I have the choice to work in this organisation. Organisations now realise that, that money is really important, but there's all of these other factors to come into play as well. So, mm. And what are they saying there is a talent shortage. There's a lot of there's a lot of talented people out there, but it's probably harder to get them to stay, certainly for long term within roles. Right? Yeah. You know, if they're not getting satisfaction, if they're not getting fulfillment, if they're not getting all of these opportunities to grow, contribute, then they're not going to stick around. And if organisations believe that they can get away with doing what they have in the past, then they're probably on a slippery slope, I would have thought. Yeah. So legacy, the word legacy, um, you've been through an emotional, I guess, change and you've found your calling and, and you're loving it and doing that and it's the best thing ever. So why do you think um, legacy is important to people? I mean, like I, when I read your bio, I, I only discovered that last year, this year. Like, mm. so I, my mother passed away and because of that, I really tapped into something that I wanted to do that's going to make me happy. And yeah. I didn't realize that I was sometimes working just to work, um, yeah. not necessarily in the last two decades, but definitely in my 20s and 30s. I just worked to go out and get money to spend money on shopping. <laughs> but now I actually don't feel like I'm working. I feel like I'm leaving something. So what is it? Why is it important? And how did you connect with your legacy after your job experience? How did you find it with how did you find your purpose or your right calling with this new job? Yeah, look. For me, legacy is, in, is important because, and I kind of touched on it before, is that, you know, we often do things around immediate satisfaction. In the moment, I'm going to do this, and this is where we kind of get in trouble. But so I say to people, if you're thinking about that, there's a story about that last day, right? This last day, we're on earth, on our deathbed, or, or whatever it might be, and we reflect back, and rarely are we going to say, well, I wish I'd spent more time in the office, I wish I'd, you know, spent more midnight kind of hours. I'm going to, re going to reflect back on, you know, I'd say, where did I go? Who did I meet? The lives that I touched, you know, who did I hug, hold, kiss? All of these things. Like that's that's kind of what life is about. So connecting with your legacy is not what it was many years ago. What was it years ago? Here's a house. Here's a car. Here's some money. And that's not what it is. It's about this entire experience. So your legacy is everything that you do each and every day. And it adds up to this piece at the very, very end. Now, what was happening with me is that I was starting to say, well, I'll own houses and I'll do this and I'll have the money, et cetera, et cetera. But, well, is that really going to be something I'd be satisfied with at the very end? Um, if I kept on doing what I was doing in regards to how I was emotionally and you know, supporting my wife and my boy, how would they look at me at the very, very end? And and I saw this story starting to play out in my mind, you know, right or wrong. Mm. And, and that's that's not what I wanted my legacy to be. I wanted my legacy to to help impact people around me, as well as you know, being a good dad and a good husband. And don't get me wrong i don't sit here saying i'm the best dad and the best husband <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination that's that's constant work but 
you know, I feel that I'm getting better and better each and every day. And that's what I want, you know, my legacy to be about. Yeah. Um, because I thought, well, like that word legacy is to me reflects when you're not here, like you're mm. gone. Right. And so I connected with it by doing my mum's eulogy. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. when I did that and it was so interesting because mum didn't have anything special. She didn't do any special work or anything. She was just a housewife. But when I wrote it, I'm going, oh, my God, this is what it is. It's I, you know, I was supposed to talk for 10 minutes. I spoke for 45 minutes. I got in trouble oh, wow. by the priest <laughs> because I was finding all these things that make the legacy. And it's really what people say. So it really made me think, okay, if I do all these things, then this is what they're going to say about me. And that's yeah. how I sort of connected with it for myself. Yeah, it's, it's each and every day how you live, love, breathe. It's not. It's not that last, last piece. You know, you've got your opportunities. So someone sitting here listening to your podcast and saying, well, I'm not too satisfied with this. You've got the opportunity to start to rewrite or write what you want it to be from this mm. moment on. You can choose to ignore that and mm. do what you were doing and that will result in whatever it might be. Or you can be purposeful with your actions to make the change. Mm. And I try to prompt that in people to say, well, what, do you, what do you want it to be about? Yeah. So because you're a coach and people come to you for help, do you mm. feel that they know that, that, that they – and I know that they don't necessarily know everything, but do they at least have an awareness that they've got to change? Or do you feel like that sometimes you get resistance from people that will keep saying, I don't know how, it's too hard or – because I do find it fascinating how sometimes people want to. They know they have to, but when it comes down to the to the crunch, they don't do the action part. Yeah, look, I, I generally find by the time someone's talking to me, they've figured out that there's something that needs to change. They're not necessarily sure in regards to this is this is what I need to mm. evolve past, and that's my role to to figure out, well, what is it? Like what is really driving these behaviours that exist within you now and why do you want to make these changes? But most people come to me saying, hey, look, there's something. They might turn around and say, well, you know, I don't know any of my values or I don't know really, you know, who I am, what I'm trying to do. You know, I have no clear aspiration. I can see that the things that I'm doing don't serve me well. Like there's a lot of reasons why people come to me. But yeah. I mean, I guess it's important. I guess I wanted to ask that question because I do think that people need to realise, especially men, that it's not weak or it's not bad to see a coach. I think we're in a time now where we need to get support so people like yourself can actually guide someone when they're, when they're stuck. Because I don't know about you, but I, there are so many times that I get someone saying, oh, my God, you're the first person I've ever said that to. Or I've never thought of that before. And so I'm thinking, okay, there's a lot of people out there that don't really know or have access to that information. If they don't go maybe and ask or get some help, they may not ever get that access. Well, let's look at it this way. How For how many decades now have people said, when I need to get fit, I'm going to go to the gym or I'm going to get a, my own personal trainer? Or, you know, elite athletes have their raft of coaches. Like it's existed around us for a very, very long period of time. But now there seems to be more of an awakening happening within people to understand that, I don't know it all, and I don't claim to know it all by any stretch of imagination, but people are starting to realise I can get support. Mm. If I can keep on doing keep on doing the same same, and I'm going to get the same results, I can keep applying the same thinking that's got me to this point in time, which might have you know, resulted in some degree of success, I can keep applying all these things and continue on that path, or I can start to, you know, enlist the support of other people to open my eyes and give me awareness on there's these other opportunities to do other things that might take me even further. And and that's really what it's about, right? Mm. Like we don't sit there and say, do X, Y, and Z. Our opportunity there is to create an awakening in someone to say, oh, I've got to do this. Mm. That's the direction I need to take. That's the, you know, for me personally, that's the, habit and behavior that i need to have in my life that'll lead me to this particular thing yeah i mean you did mention briefly some of the things while they come like i'm not connected to my values or whatever but can you try and be specific just with men and think about what is the, one of the main things that you feel that they're coming to you for like that could be a concurrent to the time or it could be traditionally a male issue 
yeah, m most of them come to me and they are talking specifically about behaviours. Right. So I am recognising that there's behaviours in the workplace that I need to change. There's behaviours in my relationship that I need to change. Or there's behaviours with my how I go about my health, both mind and body, that I need to change. That's usually where people come, come to me. And sometimes, uh, or quite often, I should say, that has been sparked by their partner saying... Yeah. You need, you need to, to go. <laughs> you need to do. You need yeah. to do something about this. You need mm. to go on have a conversation with someone. Mm. But it's good. It's good, isn't it? Like I mean, I remember when coaching. When people used to think of coaching, they'd say, "Oh, I'm going to go and see a coach so I can change jobs or whatever." But I just love the fact that now people are open enough to go and do it and get coached in looking at their behaviour. You know, like saying, "I'm going to go see a coach to, to no longer be angry," or "I'm going to go see a coach to learn how to be more assertive." Um, you know, and I know that Australia. You know, we took a while because I started doing, I started going, I went to America when I was 22 and I came back and I embraced the therapy of Amer the Americans. The, they see therapists like going to a coffee. Absolutely. And so I started seeing a therapist very young and I know, I remember people teased me, but like it just took a while, but it, it finally caught on here that it wasn't bad to actually, you know, get help. I, I sort of see it like us getting service in the car. Yeah, a hundred, hundred percent. Like, well, why would you not like what is wrong with it so okay well i don't want to talk about what's going on in my mind okay well it's going on in your mind so like let's let's get it out and understand a little bit more it's you know it's about calling bullshit on yourself mm. and, and it's about being comfortable with i don't know it all or i can't control these things I, like that's where men go wrong right mm. yeah. i hate to use the word wrong but feeling that we need to control Every yeah. single thing that's going on in us, around us, and that's a recipe for disaster. At some stage or another, you, you will come unstuck if you think that you can just control and push your way through life. It, yeah, it doesn't work. It mm. won't work forever. Yeah, and and I think that also, you know, um, we've woken up to that reactive behavior. Like I always think about Wall Street, and I always think about when Wall Street crashes. There's always like a handful of suicides, and I'm thinking, wow, like. Bang, information, i got to go. And so I think men have realized that, oh, hold on, it doesn't have to be that, that instant. It doesn't have to be that overdramatic. You know, I can actually stop and talk about it and I don't have to end my life or I don't have to do anything, um, like, you know, bad. And I guess that leads me to that vision that you have of touching or reaching a million people. Do you want to tell us a bit about that by 2025? What is your vision? Because I, I love it. I saw that number. I'm going, wow, I want to be part of that. Yeah, it's it's a big number. Um, it, look, the number came when, when I was really pulling everything together and figuring out what the business was going to be about. So, you know, I'm, I'm a life coach and behavior strategist. My coaching programs is is Dawn of Legacy. So the story behind that is that mum's um, middle name was Dawn. Mum passed away a few years ago. So it was a bit of a nod to, you know, nod to her. And, and I was thinking, well, you know, what's ambitious because in in business and life you want to be ambitious and i thought you know impacting a million lives by 2025 was a number that people could resonate with mm. and that's i wanted people just to feel right and how do i how do i be part of that million like i want to be able to you know bring other people from other communities to be part of this because you know well, why do i do this I, I do this because you know I believe everybody should have the opportunity to look back at their life and say, "Hey, I have lived a fulfilling life. I do have a legacy that I can be proud of." So, for me, how do I enable that to happen? So, if I can, at the end of the day, it's not coach a million people by twenty twenty five. It's to you know do a podcast. It's you're gonna to you're gonna seminars. you're gonna meet you're gonna meet a million before you're gonna meet it like in the next twelve months. It's like. <laughs> 2025. I reckon you should add another zero to that. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should. But um, yeah, but yeah look, that, that's that's why it was just part of this ambitious number that people could resonate with. Um, you know, I've got a newsletter which is called That's BS, and you know that continues to be a way that I get in front of people to, like I say, how do I change behavior with strategy to create a fulfilling legacy? So that's yeah, that's, that's yeah. I, really, I love it. I love the I love the excitement and the I love the I love a good transformation story. You know, mm. someone who was in one place took all those uh, experiences and skills and became a stronger force and, you know, a bigger energy in regards to um, 
their own life rather than staying stuck in the, in the, in the oh my God, like, this job is terrible, this job is terrible. So <laughs> I love that. And I think that that's going to inspire a lot of our listeners. Yeah, you, it, it took me a while to process for a while, I was like, okay, you know, there's, there's this degree of failure here. I've never failed at anything, you know, that old story. Um, you know, is how long is this going to stick with me for and replay it over and over in my mind. But I was listening to someone the other day and they were talking about a data point, right? Like we go through these keys in life and they're data points for us to be mindful of. And that was, that job at that time was a data point giving me all this information in regards to where I was at then all of the things that came beforehand were, were giving me the skills that I now apply to, to my coaching. And these are data points along the way. None of it's final until that, that very, very last day. So, you know, act accordingly, really. Yeah. yeah. Luke, thank you so much for coming on and inspiring us and teaching us about legacy. I think, you know, I think in the day of the superhero as well, we should all have that legacy, shouldn't we? We should all have that S on our chest saying, look, I'm going to do the best as a, as a strong person and um, influence people because I, I love the fact that we are all connected in some way. And someone said in the interview I did this morning, this girl has a similar a dream like yours and hers is called Ripple. And she mm-hmm. just says from one person, she's going to ripple to everyone and I it's it's a, again I love the fact that everyone I'm sort of interviewing has got these same common themes so um, I'm going to put all your information down below so people can connect and be part of your um, your vision but more importantly to reach out to you and, and see you if they need to now that I've found I told everyone that you're from Melbourne you've told everyone you're from Melbourne <laughs> and this is a global web po- podcast but more importantly just know that you can still do online stuff and they can reach you online can't they yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just head to the website, lukefenwick.com. Yeah. Um, you can connect with me there. There's social media links for you know, LinkedIn and Instagram and, and the newsletter. Yeah. That's and, if, and if you need to know there. anything about champagne, you, he's the man to contact as well. <laughs> hey, yeah, I, I, I love talking to people about champagne and wine and stuff like that. Like that was a, a beautiful time in in life and, you know, a lot of amazing memories attached to it. And, I just bought a bottle of champagne this morning. Are you going to enjoy that tonight? No, I um I got a deal. I got like this is a good deal. I got twelve dollars of wine yeah. for one hundred and thirty dollars yeah. plus the free bottle of champagne. So I really bought it full of champagne. Well, there you go. There you yeah. go. But hey, don't don't hold on to that forever. I was going to wait till Christmas. Or do you think I should do it earlier? No, I was buying another <coughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Luke. Thank you so much, and um, we'll keep in touch, and um, hopefully we will be, again be part of your vision. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you so much for the time and everybody out there, you know, be safe, be present, be you and look after yourselves. So you've been listening to the Secret Men's Business Podcast. This podcast will be out on a Monday at 9am. And don't forget on Thursdays, we do retro podcasts where we play our back catalogue. So make sure to look out for the retro podcast for the week. Again, like I said, everything about Luke will be listed below. But don't forget also to hit like and subscribe so you can find out about uh everything about this podcast and also my other podcast, the Intermediate Connection podcast. Have a great week, guys, and we'll see you all soon. Bye.